Hi and welcome to the Bay Area Creative Freelancers Guild. How many first timers do we have here? Raise your hand, first timers. Yeah, wow, lots of non-first timers. Raise your hand if you've been here before then. Whoa, same here, that's great. Um, the ghost came in, so I'm glad that they've arrived as well. Uh, again, we are Four Winds Creative. My business partner Todd and Keith are here as well. And thank you to Epifan Video for hosting us today. They've also provided our drinks. And everyone, give it up for Steve Young. Yay! Steve Young is in the house. Come on in, Steve. <laughs> he always makes an entrance, this guy. You should meet him afterwards. So just a quick um, update as to why we are here and what we do. Our mission is we nurture the creative freelance community by hosting gatherings at places like at Epifan Video. We also um, provide opportunities to share work and collaborate. So if you're here as someone who needs new clients or new business or just want new learnings and wanting to stay relevant, you're in the right place. So thank you for being here. We are a community of content creators. We focus primarily on video production, design, and animation. But honestly, we're open to anyone who gets a 1099. Not a W9 like I wrote last time when I presented. So my bad. Keith wasn't here to correct me for that one. So we are looking for people to get more involved with our meetup. We have this fantastic community of over 600 members, which Todd is our owner. Um, and we're always seeking officers who want to help, um, who want to help either set up, find presenters, find host locations, or even share work or speak like this or like Jordan and Kwong. So if you'd like to be an officer, that's our email. Just send an email over to us and we'll be happy to talk to you. And let's see. <laughs> If I could read the slide again and just awkwardly keep placing this clicker until it <laughs> advances. <laughs> oh, how come? Ah, got it. Sure. <laughs> networking in the new year. So all of us are here to learn more about networking in the new year. I'm very happy to announce that we have two people that excel at it greatly. We have um, Jordan Mott. Why did we invent a real estate agent? Because when I heard about a guy who is top 1% realtor at Intero Real Estate, and he used his LinkedIn as his primary source to finding new clients, and he was willing to share his tips with us, we said we need to have this guy present at our meetup because that's all we're trying to do is reach out, find new clients, and how to use LinkedIn more effectively, right? So Jordan's going to speak to us. And then after that, we have Kwong Lee. He is a filmmaker who has two features now under his belt, but also documentaries and a lot of other, um, do I call it corporate video, yeah, corporate video work? Okay, corporate video work too. It's all about working in the Bay Area and not needing to be in LA sometimes to do that. So it's my pleasure to introduce, I think it worked better when I did this, <laughs> Jordan Mott up to the stage. Um, here's his bio, but I'm sure he could do his own introduction um, himself. So please, let's give him a warm welcome. Is, it, is this going to work? <laughs> uh, all right, I believe in it like that. Um, well, thanks for having me here. As Char mentioned, um, Jordan Mott with Intero Real Estate Services. Um, and I've been able to utilize LinkedIn in an extreme way to be able to generate new business. And I've shared that with a lot of people, not only within the real estate industry, but outside of the real estate industry as well. And they've taken what I've told them and it's definitely benefited their businesses in regards to prospecting for and finding new clients because I think that's what we're all out there to do, right? We're out, all out there to grow our business and find new clients and figure out how we can grow and generate more uh, sources of income. Um, I've been with Intero Real Estate for a little over two years now in the real estate industry as a whole, a little over three years. Um, got into it right upon graduating college, and last year I did 40 transactions for about $50 million of production, which ended up putting me in the top 1% of realtors in Silicon Valley. Um, a lot of my clients, as I mentioned, do come from LinkedIn, and um, I'm gonna go into how I've been able to do that and how I think that that could work in any of your guys' industries. Let's see. Okay, so LinkedIn for networking. 
um, objectives for today are how to search for and become connected with relevant people on LinkedIn who can help grow your business. Um, and then how to meaningfully and genuinely nurture those relationships once you're connected with those people. Because I wish it was easy, as easy as saying that those people are going to use you for whatever your services might be right when you connect with them, but that's definitely not the case, right? There's some effort that has to be put into that to grow that relationship so that then they think of you for whatever business service you're able to provide them with moving forward. Let's see. Next one. Maybe. Maybe not. You want to just go to the next slide? Okay, so usually my LinkedIn presentation is an hour and a half. I'm not going to take you guys all through that, so there's a couple things that I've decided to focus on today. The first that I find to be most beneficial in regard to finding new clients is that we need to narrow down who we're looking for, who our potential clients are going to be and who we want to reach out to, right? Those people on LinkedIn are pretty easy to find once we narrow that down because of the search criteria that you can use on LinkedIn. When we're finding people to connect with, we can search by their company, their past company. You can search by their geographic location. You can search by their profession. You can search by their industry. And you can search by school alumni. So when I came back from school, where I went to school in Penn State on the East Coast, um, I knew that I'd have a connection with those people immediately if they relocated to California. Right? So one thing that I did was I went and found all Penn State alumni that live in the Bay Area that then either worked at Google or Apple or Tesla or all these high-tech companies that we had because a lot of our buyers and sellers and homeowners in the Valley are people that work at these tech companies that are making outrageous amounts of money that are having stock options for their down payments, et cetera. So once you narrow down whoever your specific clientele is, you can go through all of these search fields and then connect with all those people, right? If I didn't have a university affiliation, what I decided to do once I mass connected with all those people was to go through and add people that live in the San Francisco Bay Area that work at Google that used to work at Apple, right? So then I knew that all of these people met a certain search criteria. And you can do that with any company that you want to, right? Maybe people that used to work at Cisco that now work at Intel. And so then I know that all of those people meet that certain search criteria. So like I said, there's various different fields that you can go into. Um, there's th when you go onto LinkedIn and you start a search at the top in the search bar um, and come up with your first part of search criteria, say it's San Francisco Bay Area, right? Because that's the geographic location that we're located in. Then on the right side of the screen, you'll see that it comes up with a bunch of different search fields, um, keywords, uh, connections of your locations, your current companies, your past companies, industries, profile language, nonprofit insurance, schools, etc. So you can get very specific, right? You can take a certain you can take a certain search and take something from every one of those categories and significantly narrow down who you're deciding to connect with. Um, so, like I said, what do we do once we're connected with those people, right? Um, there's three different ways. I'm going to focus on just the direct messages ones for uh, essence of time. Um, and it's what I find to be the most productive. Um, you can also endorse people and then go into the recommendations aspect to further nurture those connections. But like I said, the direct messages are what I found to be most beneficial. Um, so, when it, so going back one step real quick, when I would go to that certain search criteria, right, I said that I'd mass at every, add everyone, I'd go right down the line and connect to everyone, whether I knew them or not, because I don't, in my opinion, you can never have a network that's too big. Um, so I think now my LinkedIn, my LinkedIn network is about 15,000 connections um, all throughout the country, and specifically because I never know where my next referral is going to come from, right? I never know where that business is going to come from. Just like I woke up one morning and there was a message in my inbox from a realtor in New York who I had never talked to, but I was connected to on LinkedIn. He had said, hey, I wanted to let you know that I passed along your information to an agent in Texas. And I said, okay, can I ask why? He, he said, I think that she has a referral from you. So just based off my LinkedIn presence, my information went from someone to New York, to Texas, to a buyer who was interested in purchasing here in Palo Alto. So the network that you can create is, there's no limits to it. Um, 
And I think that a lot of people are scared to connect with people that they don't know, but there's no reason that you can't get to know those people based off your LinkedIn connections pretty quickly. Um, so I go back, right? You have this search criteria, I'd mass add those people, and then I'd go back two weeks later, right? I, with the same search criteria that I previously used. Instead of a connect button there, it's now gonna be a message button if they, ask, if they accepted my invitation to connect. So then I can take that message button and I can go in and utilize that to direct message those people now that were connections. So let's see if this is gonna go. Like I said, in my opinion, it's the best way that we can get in contact with our connections on a more personal level. And then I'll take a look at their profile, see where they've worked at in the past, what their background consists of, and include some of that in your message, right? But you don't really have to dig that deep into their profile because you have a search criteria that adheres to every one of these people that you just searched for, right? So I have that search criteria that people live in the Bay Area, used to work at Google, now they work at Apple. I know that every one of those people fits that search criteria. So I can go in and develop a message that ultimately says, thank you for being connected with me on LinkedIn. It seems as if you have been very successful with your business and have had a great career up to this point. What influenced you to switch companies from eBay to Apple, right? So that was my search criteria right there. Now when people are reading this message, they think that I've taken the time to look at their profile and it seems to be a little more personal than just going right into a sales pitch or telling them what I do for a living, right? It focuses more on them. It provides them with a question that they're likely to answer. And every one of those people fits that criteria. So it, in essence, it's not a boilerplate message, but it is a boilerplate message, right? It just adheres to a certain search criteria. So whatever your audience is, you can go in and utilize that and use the direct message aspect of things to further nurture that connection, right? And then, you know, you never know when anybody's gonna need your services. You might not reach out to them on the right day, but they might need your services six months from now. So as many times as I can create a face-to-face -face connection from my LinkedIn connections, I'm gonna take the opportunity to do so, right? Like I say in here that if anyone has, whether they have real estate needs right now or not, I still wanna grab a cup of coffee with them, right? And I've had situations where someone bought a house a month before I reached out to them, which ultimately that's not ideal, right? They're probably not buying another house right away, but he wasn't happy with his realtor and he sent me 12 referrals over the last two years based off that cup of coffee, right? So that's why I think that it's very important that you utilize this and focus on them first, right? Give them a reason to respond to you and make it look like you've taken the time to figure out what their background is and then you can go into what you do and what value you can provide them. Um, just very quickly, that's the best option to put yourself in front of people, but additionally, LinkedIn updates and LinkedIn posts, you can stay in front of people all the time. Like I have people that reach out to me and they say, holy crap, Jordan, you're on my newsfeed all day long. I post on there like probably twice a day. And that's because with your updates, you never know when those are gonna hit people, right? Because it's all contingent upon when those people are logging into their profile and how far down they're gonna scroll through their feed. So I wanna make sure that there's a consistent amount of information on there so that anytime anyone logs into their LinkedIn, my name is popping up there, right? And they see what I do, they see that I'm being successful and you guys can do any of that, whether it be video content, posting that on there. I found that if I'm posting video content, that Vimeo is the best source to do so because it auto plays from there. For some reason, I don't know if Microsoft has some type of partnership with Vimeo, but if I take something from YouTube, then someone actually has to press the play button. If it's, on, if it's a Vimeo link, then it automatically starts playing when someone's through their news feed. So LinkedIn updates are short, um, usually under 600 characters, and like I said, they show up on that timeline. Um, there's also LinkedIn articles, which are long form, essentially blog posts, much longer than 600 characters. Um, these do not necessarily show up on people's timeline when you read through, but if you, if you go look at someone's profile, right underneath their basic information, such as their header, their title, their position, there's their published articles. So anything that you want people to see that you've produced, you can put right on your homepage there as well. So if you've had projects that you've created that you wanna put the links in your articles, if you have links to your videos, whatever it might be, whatever content you're creating, you can create an article for that so that that's all directly there on your profile for someone to easily access if they go and look at you. Any questions?
Um, you were mentioning that you direct message people. Did you find that there's certain days of the week and times of the week that you get better responses when you send out messages? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think that, in my opinion, it's all a numbers game, right? So, I mean, and it's got to be done consistently. When I first got into my industry, I was sending a couple hundred messages a day, and it's probably, I want to venture to say that it was probably somewhere in between a 1% to 3% response rate. So say if I was sending 100 messages that maybe I got one to three responses, it was obviously a little bit higher on those Penn State connections where I had common ground there. But I can send out 100 messages in an hour pretty easily when I'm going through that in-depth search criteria where everyone matches that, pressing the message button, copying and pasting that because I know that everyone meets that same search criteria. But I will warn you, make sure that you change their first name when you're copying and pasting it because <laughs> Susan doesn't like to be called Jeff and that doesn't <laughs> normally get you a positive response. So um, as far as time of day, I don't think there's that big of a difference. People are gonna look at their messages that are in their inbox whenever they end up getting to it. Well, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I have two questions for you. Do you, <clears throat> first question is, do you utilize any other social media to sort of uh, enhance what you do on LinkedIn, such as uh, Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook? So I'm very active <coughs> on Instagram and Facebook as well. Um, at least in my industry, there's probably a decent amount of business that comes from my sphere of influence, which is my people, my friends, my family, my colleagues, all of those things. And I was told when I first got into the industry to create a database of all those people's information and get their email addresses and phone numbers, but I didn't feel comfortable doing that because I don't think everyone wants a junk email campaign. So what I figured was that everyone that would be in that database, I was connected with on Facebook. So essentially, you'll see everything that I post on LinkedIn on Facebook as well. And so it's, it's, not, it's not as, it's a soft touch to all of those people, right? So in my industry, I'll put, I'll usually make coming soon posts, my pendings, my just listeds, my just solds, and if we look at 40 transactions last year, that's about 160 posts that are hitting people about my transaction activity. And then if I'm working my ass off at 11 o'clock at the office, I'm gonna, as cheesy as it might be, take a selfie in the office saying I'm working my ass off for my clients at 11 o'clock at night. And you know, people go and realize that stuff. Um, Instagram, it's just another thing for name recognition, in my opinion. It's difficult to generate leads from that. I have not utilized the story part of things where you can have sponsored ads and video creative. We just had someone from Instagram come in and talk to us about that for a real estate perspective last week, so that's something that I'm thinking about exploring. But one interesting point that they made on that was that if you are gonna create video uh, content that goes in that story mode as an advertisement to make sure that you have text on there because something like 90% of stories are listened or not listened to or viewed without sound. Um, and it's just gotta be very short, right? Because attention span is not very, very long if people are just clicking through those things regularly. But as far as lead generation and networking, I've found that LinkedIn is definitely the most beneficial platform to do so. Uh, second question is, uh, do you have any thoughts on LinkedIn Premium or any of those premium services that LinkedIn offers? So, I got roped into paying for LinkedIn Premium after I didn't cancel my 30-day trial membership. Um, I did not utilize anything differently having a premium membership than I did what just the way that I talked about the fact that I utilize it, right? If there is any benefit to it, I think that it's the, the opportunity to send in mail um, more often than you can with just your regular membership, meaning that you're able to reach out to people that you're not already connected to. Um, but I, after that year ended, I never signed up again, and I, I didn't really find the value in it um, to pay, I think it was something like 60 bucks a month or whatnot. It's, it's definitely not cheap. Um, LinkedIn's policy says do not add people that you do not know. Um, so there's been about four or five times that I've had to review and agree to their terms again um, because they felt like I was mass adding people, which was 110% accurate. But link, um, LinkedIn, LinkedIn called me one day and asked me how I'm utilizing LinkedIn for their real estate platform. And I said, I'm going to be completely honest with you about how I use it. Don't you dare shut down my account. Um, but I mean, 
all of those, that's what, I, that's what I said going back to the fact that in my belief, I can never have a network that's too big, right? So the more people that I'm able to connect with, uh, the better off I'm gonna be from that perspective and the more my name is hitting people. So um, I haven't found a short answer. I have not found a need to pay for premium. Well, thank you very much. Uh, anyone else have any questions? I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> um, how important is it to uh, to uh, write uh, so long messages, directly messaging uh, messages? Is it really important? As I understood, it must be personally, but uh, not this big text. You know, it's uh, maybe if you contact business angels, uh, they have not the time to to read. Uh, yeah, books. I mean, you can <laughs> definitely simplify <laughs> it. I think that. I mean, it's definitely a long message, right? But that's why, I, in my opinion, that I put that first segment in there that's about them, right? That will more often than not warrant a response from them. Um, and the reason that I do that is so that it's not such a hard sales pitch to them, right? If you're able to further nurture that connection and show some interest into what's going on in their career, then I tend to see a better response than if I were just to go into telling them that I'm a real estate agent. So I mean, I'm sure that what I have on there could be simplified in some regard um, and just ask them if they want to get a cup of coffee. But I think that it's very important to try and personalize that as much as possible. And that's the way that it seems by including that, that information based off of whatever search criteria you're using. All wonderful questions. Thank you so much for your participation. Next up, oh, thank you for attending. Here's his information. But I bet you all of you are going to find him on LinkedIn now, right? Jordan Mott. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, we are going to release the slides, so feel free. Oh, great. I'll go back. Sure. For those watching on the web, Jordan does have a more in-depth presentation that he's, if you email him, he'll be happy to email it to you. Pretty accurate? 110% accurate? Yes. <laughs> awesome. Up next, we have Kwong Lee. Um, Kwong is going to speak about some of the films, and you're going to see some of his work. And I think you guys are going to be very impressed with how he uses networking to land his jobs and also land his projects. So, please... Warm welcome for Kwang Lee. Chuck. Hey guys, uh, thanks for being here. Um, just, uh, I'm just curious to show of hands, how many people here make videos? Okay, most of us, right? How many of you guys are uh, cinematographers? E ed editors? Writers? Directors? Jack of all trades? Okay, right, we got to be, right, to, in, in the Bay Area. Um, is, am I standing in the right place? Is this okay? Okay, great. Uh, how many of you guys have made your own films or short films or feature-length films? All right, cool. Uh, um, how many of you guys have, have written or directed a feature-length film? Okay, well, I'll tell you more about that. And that's a little bit tougher not to crack, but I'll hopefully after this presentation you guys will learn more. But we're all fighting the good fight here, so that's very cool. Um, okay, let's uh, see if this works. All right, cool. So um, what I thought I'd do, you know, we're all video people, most of us are video people, so what I thought I'd do first to introduce myself, I'll show you uh, my, my reel, my company's reel, so you can see a little bit of what I've done. Uh, let's play video, please. I've always liked making very small things. It just gives people a different perspective. I think I'm by far the smallest in how small I do it. Every week, I teach a stand-up comedy workshop. For students, I feel 
need it the most. You know I've been going through TMS therapy, which is electronic shocks to the head. But the bad news is that it shifted from the anxiety, depression symptoms to actual insanity. <laughs> that was the moment I had done it. My name is Elizabeth Ashmore. I had created a technology that could give somebody the power to control a computer with their mind. I was 16. To see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wildflower, to hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. That's what science is to me, and that's poetry, so that's art and science. Our job at Intuitive is to deliver to surgeons products that allow them to fulfill their mission. Great outcomes in efficient operations. And this product is just another step in that pathway. We started down that pathway many years ago with our Da Vinci system, and this extends their ability, and therefore our ability, to help meet their needs. I don't think I'm doing this right. Oh, thank goodness. Oh, Gumby to the rescue. Could you stop by the store later? Uh, no. Hope they got insurance. It's Hill Pocket Avatars. Chat funner. Lights go out. Transformers explode. Planes fall out of the sky. Cars spin out of control. Things begin to malfunction, and then power disappears. The premise of the series is what would happen if, if one day everything just turned off. I used to be ashamed of being different, but now I'm not. I have two voices in my head. Any more and we'd be a walking gang. One is the most intimidating black dude that you'll ever meet in your life, and the other is a 70-year-old church white lady. <laughs> so I'm, I'm pretty much covered for any situation that you can possibly think of. If somebody cuts me off in traffic, the black dude is like, hey, 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 hey forget you, man. Old jive turkey, you see this bicycle? <laughs> and they, if I'm ever grocery shopping, the white church lady pretty much has me covered with, e excuse me, sir. I know you're blind, so you probably didn't see the line, but it starts behind me. Thank you. <laughs> Gotta get this wine to church communion. <laughs> okay. Now you're just fucking with me. Come on. What's going on? Could she be You're trying to scare me? It's not gonna. Gabby, the two, right? Gabby. He says he tastes better scared. All right, thanks so much. Thank you, thank you. So, yeah, I've done a, um, a, a variety of different things. And uh, well, you saw one of the projects in there. It was uh, Buddy Salter. It was, a, it was a clip from a feature film. And it's, um, it's now on Hulu, which is very cool. Um, I'll wait till they get the... Uh, but anyway, it's streaming on Hulu, and it's also streaming on uh, Amazon. And so, if if you if you like the um, 
if you liked what you see the clip there, and I'll show you a little bit of a trailer from that movie later, uh, give us a review on Amazon. It's, for some algorithm, it helps us if, if, you, guys, uh, if you put a review on for Amazon. Um, but anyways, the, the uh, all right. so there's a whole adage of um, work begets work, right? And my, my theory is that you know, work and new friends begets work. And I'm going to explain to you how sort of through networking events and going to film festivals, I've been able to uh, get my job as a, as a feature film director. The first project was my own script, but my second feature was one that uh, I was hired to direct. So that was really cool. So um, my first feature was called Buddy Solitaire. And it's um, a dramedy. And you saw a clip from it um, in the presentation. And it's currently streaming on Hulu. And so um, since we're all video people, I'll show you a minute and a half clip from, from Buddy Solitaire, uh, the trailer. Video, please. Hey, you new to Maple Hills? Uh, no, no. I'm an insomniac, hypochondriac, huge megalomaniac. Who are you? Seriously. I recently took a job teaching stand-up comedy at a psychological counseling center. What are you doing here? I'm just here to teach you guys comedy, okay? I'm gonna need to teach you some fucking manners. I'm sorry, buddy. You, uh, you expect an important phone call? Why don't you get your mother up here? Does he know I'm a hen of bales? I sacrificed my entire career for you. I could have afforded you. I've seen suicide bombers that are funnier than you. Really? What makes you think you can teach us? You're not even a real comedian, man. You're just a little mama's boy. You are worse than a girl baby in China. You done? No. I, I get what it's like being here, though. Social workers, shrinks, everybody thinks you're crazy, right? How did you get that gig? We're never going back to that shithole. Actually, I'm going back tomorrow. Oh, I really think you should give it up. Maybe I will. I gotta let a lot of that shit go, because if I don't, I'm not gonna make any room in the future to meet new people. I, I truly mean this, thank you. that job um, through um, networking, right? And um, basically, I was doing the film festival circuit. It was in the Newport Beach Film Festival. And uh, I went to one of those filmmaker events, right? And you know how sometimes you kind of don't feel like being social? You know, you, like you hear about those events, and you kind of like, ah, I don't really want to go. But you know, I got out of my comfort zone, and I went, just like you guys all did today. You know, so it's, 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 it's the exact same thing I did. I met this woman who had a short film in the film festival, and she had this dream project, this script, that she just was looking for a director to come bring to life, right? And she saw my film, she liked Buddy Solitaire. And the thing was, is that I would have never have gotten the opportunity to direct that film, and it was a paid project, which was cool, unless I wasn't at that networking event, right? That filmmaker event was the thing that sort of uh, led me to that, that project. And it was through uh, exactly that, getting out of my comfort zone. Um, I'm not an expert at, uh, at PowerPoint yet. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think it's that thing. I, I mean, I'm sure, how many of you guys have, have kind of had an invitation to some event, but you have second thoughts, like, um, should I go or not? It's not, you know, right, exactly. I would encourage you to always, always do that. And you guys are on the right track by going to an event like this today. Um, so yeah, that was the comfort zone thing. So I not only do, um, features, but I also do short documentaries. And I, I'm doing this project, a series of short documentaries for um, a company from Canada. They're called Omore Media. And the way I got this project was also through networking, right? And I'll show you a, a quick video of, of, of these projects, and I'll tell you how I got uh, this, this series.
I've always liked making very small things. It just gives people a different perspective. I think I'm by far the smallest in how small I do it. I try to make anything that you would otherwise make big. Room interiors, uh, a kitchen table. I've made many chess pieces, various goblets, a miniature camera. Anything that you can make big, I try to make really small. The scale that I work in is typically 1 to 144. Dollhouse for dollhouse, they call it. So this could sit in a dollhouse as a dollhouse for that place. I try to make little spinning tops and chess pieces and goblets, you know, down to a thousandth of an inch diameter, much smaller than a hair. Now that's the big one. That's, that's next the big to it, one. next about a, qu about a quarter inch that way is another speck. Oh my God! That's the that's the small one. I thought there was dirt on the land. <laughs> <laughs> and then you give them a magnifier, and it's like, ah, oh, there is something there. Oh my God! Did you see it? Yeah, I see isn't it. that amazing? <laughs> I don't There's a believe it. On top of that pencil. And then people looking at it and say, you actually made this by hand. And it's like, yes, I made this by hand. And then people are all amazed. I, I would never have thought that anybody could turn something that small. They're so tiny and they're so beautiful. He's just quite the craftsman. The tool I mainly use is my lathe. And I made myself a miniature lathe that I can use to turn really, really small things. I then first cut a piece of wood, say the size of a matchstick. And that matchstick, I put in my lathe, and then I start turning it round. So I make it smaller, smaller, so I get a piece of wood sticking out that is about the size of a hair. And then in there, I start to cut the actual detail. I use very fine files, scalpels that I then have to sharpen even further, little chisels that I have to make myself by sharpening an old screwdriver, a, a miniature screwdriver, bits of very fine sandpaper. I then have to zoom in you know, with a little magnifier and look at it very closely to carve that final detail onto it. It can take several hours. As a day job, I design satellites and space missions. Some people say it's rocket science, but they also do rocket engines. And a lot of that is very detailed, very precise work. Every time people come up with new and advanced ideas about what they might want to do in space, you know, somebody wants to take pictures or measure something, I have to somehow come up with a solution of doing that that has not been done before, then I have to put it into reality. Similar in doing my miniature woodwork, I try to make something new every time, to try to go just that bit further, just a little bit better. If I can still see it, it's not small enough, and I have to try again to make it even smaller. Many people have suggested that obviously I have too much time and I need to find myself a hobby. My response to that is typically, did you see the playoffs last night? and they go, oh yeah, 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 yeah. So well, I didn't, I made this. People look at it and they get excited and that's, that makes it worth it. I always look for a solution that is different than what you expect to do things that nobody else has done before. A pretty interesting guy, huh? He lives like down uh, in Gilroy, so uh, he's, he's got this whole like crafting studio there. It's really interesting. Um, so, so basically, like the story of how I got landed this series, I've done about four of these these uh, these these documentaries for this company. Is um, a friend of mine wanted uh, me to help AD on his short film, right? And and uh, there wasn't any money in it, but I did it for free because I liked my, my my friend and he had a good crew and I liked the story. But interestingly enough, the DP from that short film uh, had done a few of these documentaries for this company, Omor, and they, he recommended me as a director when they were looking for more directors in the Bay Area. So by doing this, 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 this job for free, this AD project, um, it led to an actual real project. I'm sure that happened to you guys before, right? You do a project for free, you help someone out, but that's led to a gig in the future. Um, and so essentially, here's the takeaway, right? Um, 
all of the, the cool narrative projects and documentaries I've projects I've gotten are from connecting with other filmmakers and other content creators. Um, uh, it, once in a while, it pays to do uh, free work. It, it pays to get yourself out there, and and those those kind of freebies can lead to dividends down the line. Um, get out of your comfort zone, right? And finally, in the end, you know, work and new friends who begets new work. And that's my presentation. And uh, I'll take any questions if you guys have any. Wonderful videos, by the way. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, What's your name? My name is Austin. Austin, nice to meet you. Uh, I wanted to ask, is, is uh, feature filmmaking or narrative filmmaking in general, is that your, your main hobby? Or, I mean, your main passion, your, what, what you're going for? Or are you more, it's something that you do on the side? Well, you know, like a lot of you guys, um, how, much of you, how many of you guys make money doing corporate videos? Same with me, right? I, uh, I make, I run video for a, a science company here in, in Silicon Valley. They're, well, they're based uh, in Waltham. Uh, that's where their headquarters are. But it's a company, company called Thermo Fisher Scientific, and I manage their videos. But essentially, all of the time I, I don't spend doing videos for them, I'm working on narrative projects. And so I would say, yeah, it's definitely a passion. Do you find uh, working in narrative uh, media in the Bay Area is a little difficult? since the market is more geared towards corporate video and uh, tech companies here? You know, I'll be honest with you. Both of the features I've done have been, have been shot in Los Angeles. But the third film that I'm doing is set here in the Bay Area. So there's a lot of talented uh, filmmakers like yourselves here in the Bay Area. It's just that um, traditionally a lot of productions are done down there. But I, I see things changing all the time. Like 13 Reasons Why was shot up here. Right, lots of... Uh, um, Lots of uh, Netflix series are shot here, so I think there's a change. Okay. Yeah. Do you see yourself going down to, going down to LA at any point, or shifting fully to narrative media, or just you want to stay firmly loyal to the Bay Area? You know what? Um, that's a great question. I love uh, doing technology videos. It's fun, you know. And so even if I if I got a full time job directing like a TV series or uh, or uh, some movies back to back, I would definitely still. Uh, do, do technology videos, you know, because it's just great to, to share this kind of uh, content with the world that people are making these amazing discoveries here. You know, I, I, I'd say they're both great in their own way. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Uh, my question is, is there anything that you picked up from working uh, video in a corporate, in the corporate setting sure. that helped you in the narrative world? Uh, absolutely. The first thing that comes to mind, I've asked, been asked this before, um, is that uh, getting stuff done and on time, right? Like with the, the, the corporate work, you know, you have a set amount of budget and you, you got to get it done in that amount of time. And you don't have that much time for sort of lollygagging around, right? And especially for, um, for narratives where people are working for, for very little money and sort of for passion, you don't want to burn them out, right? So you want to get your shot list done in a very, very succinct amount of time. And so I think that efficiency that sort of uh, professionalism that I learned through corporate video making, I can take to narrative. Um, you mentioned that you did the film festival circuit, and I've I've had the experience of going just to watch films at a festival, and then actually being a filmmaker at a festival. And the access you get is very very different between the two. When you started networking through film festivals, were you there because you had a movie in the festival, or were you just there? to see what was going on, see other films, kind of that, that side of it? That's a great question. Um, I think it's definitely worthwhile to go to the film festivals, to, uh, e even if you don't have a film there, just to kind of uh, watch films. It's always important. Independent films need your support, right? So I think if you have a chance to go to independent film festivals, go. And there's two of them, two great ones here in the Bay Area. There's Cinequest, where Buddy Solitaire played, and there's the San Francisco International, which is fantastic as well. Um, but in terms of practical, advice, you have a lot more leverage if you have a film there, right? Like, um, I think if you have a project, even if it's like a, a short film or a short documentary or a documentary, it's, it's, you have a lot more leverage if you have a project than if you're there as a fan. But either way, it's important to go. Yeah. So when you moved from, uh, when you made your feature before that, how much experience did you have in making or short films, or yeah, that's a good question. I, I had I went to film school, um, and I made some really bad short films there. 
really terrible. If you guys watched it, I would be so embarrassed. I'd be hiding it under one of those, those desks. But um, I think I made about seven short films before I made my feature. And also, to your question about how does corporate filmmaking uh, help, um, then when I moved to the Bay Area, I think I'd done like 50 corporate videos you know, before than I did uh, my, my feature. So that, that combination of short film narrative experience plus the sort of um, uh, process and craftsmanship of making the, the corporate videos all led to, to improving myself as a filmmaker. I'm just wondering how you feel like the corporate video narrative is evolving. Hmm. What's most important today? That's a good question. That's a good question. You know, like my colleagues here, my friends at uh, Four Winds can answer that as well. But I think that um, I think that there is a corporate video actually is actually a pretty cool place to be these days because uh, they're resourced well. You know, uh, this is a funny story. One of the videos I did at uh, at Intel that was a I think a one minute video had more budget than my entire feature film. The entire movie, you know? And so that just goes to show that sometimes uh, they can be resourced really well and, you, and, and, and crew people want to kind of work on these because um, they're an opportunity to, to, to try new techniques. I just recently did a VR video I was telling Keith about. Um, you can try new things. Um, people are using uh, narrative approaches. So I think there's a lot of interesting things be being done in, in corporate video, commercials, what, what have you. Absolutely. Yeah, no problem. It's a very talkative group tonight. It's great. It's great. Hi. Uh, my first. <coughs> yeah. My first question is, uh, uh, why do you shoot more corporate videos than commercials, uh, like TV commercials or yeah. YouTube commercials? So. Uh, well, <coughs> I think the short answer is because I live in the Bay Area, right? I think a lot of commercial production, like TV commercial production, is done in Los Angeles. Because I live in the Bay Area, <coughs> the sort of bread and butter of what we all do is, is, is work for the companies. Um, so yeah, it's a geographical thing. Uh, <coughs> my second question is, um, how did you raise money for your first uh, oh, feature and, okay. uh, and uh, have it made its budget back? Uh, uh, good yeah. question, good question. You know what's funny is, in, if you're in a film festival, those are, you've asked two of the questions that people don't allow the people to ask. What's your budget for your movie? You know, did Matrix money back? But because we're a great group here, I'm gonna answer your questions. Um, how did I raise money? Um, for Buddy Solitaire, uh, I had a, um, a producer who found some, some, a couple of uh, financiers from China, and they put in uh, uh, some money. And then the sort of honest truth of it is, I put in some money myself. And without that, oh yeah, and the third thing is I did a Kickstarter. That was successful. Um, that was like a full-time job. So that crowdsourcing is, is definitely a lot of work. So it's between um, outside financing, crowdsourcing, and myself putting in money. That's why I was so relieved when my second feature, I, 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 it was a job, you know, I did it, I did it, I got paid for it. Thank God, whoo! So that was, a, that was a great step. And did it make its money back? Um, after we got the Hulu licensing deal, it started to make some money back. Um, the way the uh, investment works is that financiers, the, the investors get their money back first before me. And so there's, there's, there's two, we have two investors. The first one got his, all, his money back all, uh, 100%. And the, ha the second person is get, that has about half his money back. So is it profitable yet? No, but it's the long game. And I got to make a movie. So I too like tech videos. Sure. Um, but I was wondering, sometimes technological advances are really cool on paper, but not visual. So because you have a creative background, how do you bring the technological advances to life in video? Right. That's a great question. Uh, this is kind of like a corporate video workshop here. It's, it's kind of <laughs> well. What I find is that uh, one challenge you often have, and I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate, that a lot of times uh, the people you're interviewing, if it's an interview video, if they, even they're amazing technologists, they're not the most brilliant speaker in the world, right? So that's one thing, coaxing a good performance out of your speaker. And the second thing um, is, is just to make it as, as visual as possible. I'm sure these are not things that are new to you. Using motion graphics, right? Um, and then just basically making it so that you're, when you're watching your video and you're kind of crafting it, is that like, you want to make this video as accessible to as many people as possible. So if you're crafting it and it's like a runtime of 16 minutes and like a t bunch of 
jar god, you know it's not gonna work, right? So how do you get to like a four minute, three minute time frame? How do you get the, uh, how do you parse the interview so that it's as accessible as possible? All those things to kind of keep in mind as you're trying to make it as accessible as possible. Those are just some things I, I found that worked for me. And, yeah. Um, as you, ha you have a full-time job doing video in a uh, scientific tech company. Obviously, doing a feature film uses up a lot more time than doing short films. A lot of us work doing short films because sure. it's a long weekend or two right. weekends. Um, I'm working with a crew on a uh, feature right now. I work, we've scheduled days 9, 10, and 11 of shooting. But we started last July. Oh, wow. So when you're doing a kind of full-fledged feature like that, how do you work that around your full-time job yeah. to get 20 days of production in a yeah. row or whatever it yeah. takes? Is that's it just your company is very understanding, or how does that work? That's a great question. I hope my boss isn't listening to me right now. <laughs> no, um, I've been had very, I've had very um, understanding employers. Uh, um, usually, if you have a full-time job, there's like a, a couple of weeks of vacation, right? And if you've been there for a couple of years, that turns into two to three weeks. If you're freelance, you know it's a lot easier. You can kind of like your time is yours. But if you have a full-time job, what I've done is I've uh, taken vacation and, and plus um, a, uh, a, a unpaid leave. I have to. Um, what's been the blessing and curse of the independent film world is these are short schedules, right? Unlike corporate video where like it's an eight-hour day, sometimes even less, right? The, uh, the independent film days are 12 hours, right? And as a director, someone above the line, I went back home and I watched dailies. So these were like 16, 17 hour days. And the funny thing is, after I finished the, uh, my last shoot, I was wanting to get back to the corporate world because it was like so draining. It, my first feature was shot in, uh, in uh, it was 105 pages in um, 18 days. The second movie, the second feature, the one I wasn't, uh, the one that hired me was 115 pages with 15 days. So it was super intense. It was super, super intense. And so, um, yeah, the, the blessing and curse is that you don't, you're not going to take, for neither of my features were, was it over 20 days. One was 18, one was 15. So that was kind of, in the in the ballpark of, of a vacation plus time off, yeah. And guys, also I'll be I'll be hanging out. So if you guys have questions, feel free to hang out and like shoot the breeze. Um, besides for the in-person film festival networking events, have you leveraged uh, any other kind of social media um, to network or to get? funding for your videos, or just to meet people and make opportunities? Well, after listening to this, this gentleman's pr uh, the pr uh, presentation, I'm going to direct mail all of, uh, all of LinkedIn. No, I'm just kidding. Um, well, you know, let me think. If I kind of think back on, on these two experiences, it's been in person. But, um, but uh, there, on Facebook, there's a lot of groups, you know, there's like, Bay Area filmmakers, production resources, you know, there, I think uh, people post on these groups, hey, I'm looking for, um, you know, a DP, or I'm looking for um, uh, di different roles. Um, I, I don't think I've seen, like, you know, looking for a, a, a feature director yet, but that doesn't mean that, they're not, that it's not there. So I think Facebook, those groups, is, is a good place to start. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Let's also um, thank yeah, our first presenter, Jordan Mott, also. Well, you know what? I, 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 I was, I was like, I, could, I, I didn't know how to do the, the PowerPoint was a little bit of a disaster, viewers. but I think like, the, the Q&A was fine. Yeah. <laughs> oh, six. We have six. Thanks, Mom. Um, <laughs> awesome. Also, our next meetup is actually going to be at a new studio over in Milpitas. It's called Cinema Exchange. It's a co-working space for... Um, video production, graphic designers, video game people. So that's March 22nd, so make sure you mark your calendar. And, um, and the grand opening. Thank you. That I'll be there. The grand opening yeah. is tomorrow night <coughs> in Mercita. So we hope we see you on March 22nd. Um, networking is hard. All of you did a wonderful step in even just being here. So hang out. We're here for another 30 minutes, and then we're going to start cleaning up. But we have tons of food, so please help yourself. So thank you, everyone. Yay, thank you. <laughs>